So let's get back to doing. I know we've been doing a fair bit of talking here. Let's get back to doing. I'd like to introduce you to Neil Trevitt. He's the president of the Kronos Group. He's also VP for the mobile ecosystem for NVIDIA. Active uh, advisory board member as well as a true mentor <laughs> for the Immersive Technology uh, Alliance. So please, let's give him a round of applause. Hey, good morning. Thank you, Neil. Uh, it was a good introduction. And Neil's asked me to, if I can find my slides, to uh, talk about standards. Now, as Neil has already uh, outlined, <laughs> ITA does a lot of stuff. Uh, thanks. And standards is just one uh, element to what the ITA could do and could get involved with. Uh, but Neil has asked me to spend a couple of minutes trying to distill down to its uh, essence what what is a standard? Why is it useful? And hopefully that would inform uh, how the ITA should and could uh, get involved in building the relevant standards for the markets that we're uh, interested in. So, um, what is a standard? Now, I'd be talking about a particular kind of standard, but I think it's most normally uh, talked about, which is an inter interoperability uh, interface. In, in, to slip down to its very core uh, essence, uh, a standard is uh, a, a way, an, an, an agreement, a contract between two different communities of some description that need to communicate with each other. And there's a very um, straightforward business reason why you'd want to do that. Uh, you can, through using standards that get rid of friction uh, in building products in the marketplace, you can reduce the cost of reducing <coughs> compelling end user experiences and uh, build the market. Um, and part of the chaos phase that uh, Neil was talking to is to think you get uh, functionality fragmentation, things don't work together, that becomes a real break on how you can grow uh, a, a market and it really prevents mar uh, markets from growing and companies from making money, which in, in the end, of course, is the engine that drives everything forward. So, of course, we get involved in a bunch of different things, but mobile phones is uh, the biggest market and, of course, that's totally dependent on standards. I'm just Try to imagine building the mobile phone market if you didn't have things like LTE uh, or Wi-Fi or USB. Well, uh, your mobile phone in your pocket is packed with literally hundreds of standards that allow stuff to communicate with something else. Be it software to software, hardware to software, cables to connectors. Uh, it's uh, the standards are everywhere. Now I'm not going to talk, not going to be talking too much about Kronos in particular here, but I just wanted to give you the context. Why am I saying what I'm saying? Lots of the lessons I'm going to try and relay have come from a Kronos experience, so just to give you that context. In, in particular, the Kronos group, we are, the two communities that we're addressing and trying to enable to communicate are the uh, hardware community, the people designing chips, GPUs, CPUs, and the developer community, people developing applications. We're trying to enable application developers to get down into hardware acceleration for graphics, compute, sensor processing, uh, stuff like that. So that's, that's the context for the lessons that, we, that we've learned from our uh, experience. So, Neil will answer you a few questions. So, when should you standardize? And I think the, um, the most basic answer is not too soon. It's <coughs> very easy to try and standardize stuff before the industry really knows what it wants to do. And I think the VR market is in, in many cases in this Darwinian uh, experimental phase that, that an industry has to go through. Um, it becomes possible and uh, a positive thing to start thinking about interoperability standards once the chaos begins to subside. And it may subside at different rates in different areas. Um, and best practices begin to emerge. Uh, they're beginning to be needed through the industry, and there are clear pain points. So if only this would communicate to that, you know, we could all make more money. That is kind of the sure sign that the time is right to start considering about the standard. Uh, if you try to insert itself, if a standards body tries to insert itself before then, I think you're going to end up um, not being effective and wasting everyone's time and actually potentially cause, causing pushback because you'll be seen as trying to dictate to the industry as the industry is still trying to figure out what it needs to do. So, 
And then the final clarity, the final proof point that uh, standards are really needed is that there is real clarity in the industry that interfacing um, between different vendors, different communities is more valuable than a proprietary lock-in that some people might have been trying to get before. And from that, the goals will emerge for what the standard needs to do. And the ITA's contribution in this phase, I think, as Neil says, is getting people to talk. Uh, don't underestimate the value of talking to people in the industry. Uh, uh, proactive discussions, trying to be you know, on the radar, scanning constantly for where are the pain points, uh, what can we encourage the industry to do to uh, solve those pain points, create the appropriate standards that will drive the industry forward. It's likely to be a group like this that has earliest insight into those pain points as they come over the event horizon. So that's what went to standardize. So what to standardize? Once you have actually figured out, oh, there's an opportunity here, and we can help by encouraging uh, a standard. Um, what, what, what do we do? Well, again, don't try and do something too soon. I think it's really the, the, my fundamental lesson. Is. In particular, you don't want to uh, try and solve the standardization problem by designing by committee. A committee is great at many things. Working group. Committee sounds so bureaucratic. Like a working group sounds better. But design by committee is like the most horrible, painful thing we'll ever go through. But refinement by committee, if someone can bring pretty well formed um, ideas to the table on how this particular pain point, this interoperability problem, can be solved, and you can get the collective wisdom of a group of engaged vendors in the industry refining that, knocking off the rough, ed rough edges bringing different perspectives to strengthen the design and to make sure it meets uh, the true needs of the industry. Uh, a, a really effective working group with multiple perspectives can do a much better job at that refinement process than I think any one company, which almost by definition has a single single perspective from their, from their own business. So, um, refinement by committee, uh, people to bring contributions, so you need participants that are willing to share those contributions, uh, technology and solutions, and then set up a <coughs> cooperative refinement uh, environment. And the ITA value here, now, currently I think, and Neil, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think the ITA is thinking of defining standards itself, um, because that requires quite a lot of machinery. Now, it's a possibility that we It's much too early. Much too early, right? <laughs> much too early to right. even... Uh... Right. So, and, unless we get to that phase at some point where ITA wants to define our own, when we find this opportunity and you're finding people that want to participate, uh, I think the actionable thing right now would be to identify an SDO, a standard defining organization. And there are hundreds in the industry, and uh, most of them have a little niche, and as I say, problems is niches, hardware and software for application developers, but there are many others. Uh, finding the right SDO to, would be the right SDO to solve that particular problem, and going to them with a good input on requirements and needs. Uh, I think, you know, again, this group can really be a catalyst to tr help drive the industry forward. Now, I've dropped in a slide here, uh, which is not VR, it's AR. There's kind of sister group, um, uh, the AR standards community. It's an informal group, but they meet every quarter or so to talk, to talk about AR. And this is kind of the interfaces that AR needs, and there's more, perhaps more cloud services than strictly VR might need, but I, I think VR might need it too. So, and that's precisely the discussion that they're having. They're saying, well, you know, we need to have platform APIs for graphics compute, and that's, that's the Kronos group, but we need to have the, how do the sensors going to be interfaced into, at the hardware level, and that's maybe, um, we want the web to be a platform, um, and I think that's going to be particularly important for, for VR. W3C can get involved and help there. Uh, AR is all geographic information. OGC is very active in AR. Uh, we want to have not just 3D uh, and video being transmitted, but um, video audio. And the MPEG group you know, is also has a lot of uh, expertise and history there. So picking out the uh, right SDOs to help solve the right problem you know, is something that I think is a very productive uh, conversation. So, once you go through it, how do you know when you've actually created a successful standard? 
Well, it's easy to create a bad standard. Um, and uh, one way you can create a bad standard is it brings everything down to a lowest, <coughs> lowest common denominator. It stifles rather than uh, encourages innovation by forcing everyone to implement a lowest common denominator. But a good standard enables uh, innovation. And the first way it does it is you have your two communities, whatever they are, <coughs> cooperating, and they can begin with a well-defined interface between them, they can begin to innovate at their own rate. If the software can move ahead of the hardware, the software doesn't have to be held back because the hardware needs a little more time. As long as there's an interoperability interface that stays constant, uh, or if the hardware is moving ahead of the software, you know, they can move and innovate uh, more quickly. And secondly, a good standard will typically not dictate implementation techniques. So, in fact, a good standard should be at the right level, I think, that um, implementation techniques can be a real area of differentiation and competition. We need competition to drive the industry forward. Um, but as long as the interoperability interface stays constant, you can enable that healthy Darwinian competition whilst not fragmenting the industry. And a good standard finds the right level uh, to make that happen. And that can be quite an art form to find uh, the right level. I wanted to use this one example from Kronos. We had a bunch of announcements this week, and one of them is like the perfect example. <laughs> I couldn't resist it. Uh, Spear is a uh, standard portable intermediate representation for those doing <coughs> compiler and language stuff. This is the interface between the front end of the compiler, which is all the language front end, and the back end of the hardware runtimes. Now, all compilers kind of have an, an intermediate language, but for the first time we have now a standardized IR uh, across vendors that supports graphics and parallel processing. It's similar to LLPM, uh, but has graphics and uh, parallel processing. And because now this is a cross vendor standard, suddenly we're enabling two communities to work and innovate independently. It's the language front end guys and the hardware uh, back end runtime guys. And I think you know, I hope and believe that this is going to be a great example of uh, a standard that is the right standard at the right place because it's enabling two communities that really want to innovate but have been kind of held back because they haven't had an effective interface uh, between them. I will say competition again is healthy. In fact, in my experience, um, if an open standard exists without a proprietary competitor, there's something wrong in the ecosystem. You actually need the competition to push things forward. Uh, it, it, it is a healthy dynamic. So OpenGL has had DirectX, uh, OpenCL has CUDA, <coughs> Falcon's had this new graphics API, had Mantle, Cloudler and FPX, HTML5 and Flash, the Flash is MIA at the moment, HTML5 needs a new competitor. But overall, don't be afraid of competition uh, if you have a standard. No, it's, it's a normal and healthy thing. And last thing is the eternal struggle, um, platforms and vendors. So if you're creating standards, uh, in many cases you'll get pushback from some of the platform vendors. And again, this is another uh, hoop that a successful standard has to jump through, is to make sure that it's actually adding value both to the platform vendors, which in the end are the gatekeepers to shipping uh, product in many cases, and um, and the independent hardware and software vendors. Now, the idealized universe at the you know, um, ridiculous extreme uh, for a platform vendor is that everyone is locked into their platform and nowhere, no one can sell anything to uh, any other platform because you know, they are uh, they are setting the proprietary standards that everyone has to conform to. Now, see, that's on the uh, ridiculous end, but that, that's the direction that platform vendors would like to go. They would like to lock in content, they would like not, that content not to go off onto other people's platforms. On the other side of the pendulum, there's the independent hardware and software vendors. Their business model is best served if they can sell their hardware and software products across the maximum number of platforms at no incremental cost. And obviously that's never going to happen either, but that's the kind of direction that the IHVs and IS ISCs would like the industry to go. So, actually, it's the independent vendors that have more of a, a fundamental need, in many cases, for open standards. And so, an open standard 
often comes from that direction and it has to convince the platform vendors that they're going to win more than they lose by adopting uh, open standards. And then lastly, the last slide here, busting some standardization myths. Um, standards, first one I hear all the time, standards are slow to develop. Um, I actually disagree. If you have a standard that's really, that has passed all the criteria we've just discussed, it's solving a real problem, time is right, people want to get involved, then you can actually do it really fast. An individual company might be able to produce a spec faster than a working group working together. But I, I would suggest that an effective working group is the fastest time to ecosystem rather than just time to spec. Um, and OpenCL, for example, just took six months because we had people really leaning forward into that, into that process. Another one I hear all the time is if I participate in open standards, I lose my IP, and you know, any good SDO will have a well-proven IP uh, framework to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, typically, you know, members will agree not to assert against each other, but other than that, your IP is safe. Your license typically is very narrow, and you should check the IP framework before engaging with any SDO, but all the proven SDOs have you know, got the IP problem uh, well solved. And then last but not least, the standards are boring. I totally disagree. <laughs> a good standard in the making is the industry coming together and solving problems uh, in a very dynamic and uh, fundamental way. So it's kind of fun. All right, thanks.